You're listening to Making Waves, fresh ideas in freshwater science. Making Waves is a bi-monthly podcast where we discuss new ideas in freshwater science and why they matter to you. Making Waves is brought to you with support by the Society for Freshwater Science, Arizona State University's School of Life Sciences, and the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. Welcome to the Making Waves podcast brought to you by the Society for Freshwater Science. I'm your host, Stephen Elser. This month, we're joined by Stephen Cook, who's a PhD candidate in the Department of Biology at Baylor University. Uh, thanks for joining us, Stephen. Uh, I appreciate it. It's good to talk to you, Stephen. Uh, uh, so first, we're going to just start things off with an easy question. How are Chip and Joanna doing? <laughs> um, uh, I got to tell you, that's a uh, it's... It's really weird for local Wacoans uh, that Waco has become a a, a tourist uh, trap, as it were, uh, <laughs> since the fixer up uh, fixer upper uh, explosion of popularity. So I think they're doing great. Um, you know, uh, Magnolia Market's a fantastic resource for downtown Waco. So yeah, I think th- think they're doing really well. <laughs> okay, great. I'm happy to hear it. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, you're a PhD candidate at uh, at Baylor. So can you tell us a little bit about your uh, general research interests? Uh, I am a, uh, a freshwater stream ecologist, uh, and I, I took kind of an odd path uh, to academic research. Um, I was not interested in ecology when I first learned uh, you know, when I first read a book about it and first took a class on it, um, and then kind of on a whim. Uh, took a, a class on aquatic biology that primarily dealt with benthic macroinvertebrates or uh, aquatic insects uh, primarily and was just was blown away by the amount of uh, diversity in life uh, and how interesting it was, you know, just underneath the water surface. And I've kind of been uh, enthralled with that uh, from that point on. So most of my research kind of centers around um the, the stream community, uh, primarily how macroinvertebrates are re, uh, responding to certain anthropogenic stressors. Um, so my research kind of um, uh, sits at the center of, you know, biodiversity research, but also uh, introducing some, you know, temporal components uh, uh, and seasonal successional patterns um, and how biodiversity is affected by anthropogenic stressors. Wow, great. Uh, so you say that you're a big fan of uh, aquatic insects. Do you have a favorite taxa? Um, gosh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think a uh, caddisfly, uh, Marilia, uh, I think might be, might be my favorite taxa just because, uh, it, it can get some like beautiful head patterns. Um, it's just a really interesting, uh, interesting taxa. So yeah, I think, think probably that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good choice. Uh, all right, great. So you recently published a paper uh, entitled Freshwater Eutrophication Drives Sharp Reductions in Temporal Beta Diversity. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this paper, uh, what your general goals were, and then what you found? Sure, absolutely. So that paper, um, I think it's important to mention up front, that uh, that paper grew out of a much larger study uh, that was being conducted by my advisor, Dr. Ryan King, uh, in the Illinois River uh, in Oklahoma and Arkansas. So this is the, the Illinois River in Oklahoma and Arkansas, not the Illinois River in Illinois, which is you know a source of confusion when I you know try to tell my family about what I do. Um, so... And the watershed that houses the Illinois River is is special in in a few different ways. Uh, And one of them is that it spans uh, a pretty wide gradient of nutrient enrichment. Um, There are some really pristine streams with, you know, very minimal human influence. Uh, And there are some streams in that area that are are quite enriched uh, and have elevated phosphorus concentrations due to human activities and everything in between. Uh, And Ryan was tasked with determining at what point or what concentration uh, elevated phosphorus caused a shift in the algal species composition or algal biomass. Uh, and I was one of the graduate students assisting with that project. Uh, so, and this paper, um, came out of that. Uh, so that the larger study was a, was a really fantastic opportunity for graduate students, you know, like myself, uh, to, to leverage that larger data set to answer uh, questions of my own that that I was interested in, uh, because the Illinois River watershed is really uniquely suited for conducting natural experiments to answer questions about how eutrophication is is influencing freshwater communities. 
Um, and we've, we've kind of already, you know, alluded to it, but I, I love benthic macroinvertebrates. I think they're a really important part of the stream ecosystem, um, and really interesting critters to study. Um, so this paper, uh, grew out of, of, uh, it's called, it was called the SRJS study, the Scenic Rivers, uh, uh, joint phosphorus study. Uh, and this paper grew out of that. Um, and it primarily answers the question about uh, how the benthic macroinvertebrate communities are being affected temporally by phosphorus enrichment. Um, and there's really, there's only one thing that you need to know to, you know, uh, for listeners that don't, you know, study benthic macroinvertebrates and don't know a lot about them. There's really only one thing that you need to know to understand the study. And that is under natural conditions, uh, benthic macroinvertebrates are really seasonally variable. Uh, and a lot of these critters are specialized to, to make a living and be effective competitors at certain times of the year. Um, and the paper in ecology, uh, demonstrates and outlines how when you increase total phosphorus concentrations, uh, you get uh, declines in the amount of natural seasonal variation present in these macroinvertebrate communities. So you get more homogenous communities or, or, or communities that are more similar in time as phosphorus concentrations increase, which is a really, which is a really cool finding and, and one that I wasn't necessarily expecting. Um, uh, because I was originally thinking of this uh, of this study system kind of as a as a spatial question and not ne necessarily a temporal one, um, so it was kind of neat to see that. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned uh, eutrophication as uh, as one of the aspects that you were studying here. Can you talk a little bit about uh, eutrophication? Just can you define it for us? What is eutrophication? Sure. So eutrophication. Um, you know, at its core is basically uh, just what happens when too many nutrients get into a system. So aquatic systems uh, fall on a continuum of productivity um, and the level of nutrients available to organisms for growth is one of the primary controls on that productivity. And when I say nutrients, I'm, you know, I'm talking about like the big two, I'm talking about nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and on one end of the spectrum, we have systems where nutrients are pretty scarce. So those, these are the really pristine streams in the Illinois River uh, drainage basin. Uh, and these are called oligotrophic systems. Uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, we have systems where nutrients are much, much higher. And these are called eutrophic or hyper eutrophic systems. So eutrophication is when the levels of nutrients in the water, you know, get to this higher level that they're, they're too high and they, they, elicit really uh, large increases in productivity. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so you also uh, mentioned, uh, in the, so it's right in the title of your paper, um, you mentioned temporal beta diversity. And you talk a little bit about, uh, you sort of defined it earlier on, but could you more explicitly tell us what exactly is beta diversity? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And one that's been kind of hashed out in the literature in recent years, um, t beta diversity, like as a whole, is has kind of become this umbrella term to encompass a bunch of different things and cover a bunch of different nuance. Uh, and beta diversity can mean a bunch of different things to to different people, depending on you know the type of question that you're trying to tackle. But at its at its core, beta diversity just describes the amount of variation. Uh, community to community or assemblage to assemblage. So you have, you know, spot measurements of diversity. Let's, let's just take it uh, at simplest level, just species richness. You have, you can have a, a spot level of species richness at a particular place at a particular time. And that's called alpha diversity. Um, but that, that only gives you information about one particular site. You, you, what is a lot more valuable is comparing two different sites uh, and beta diversity captures the dissimilarity or the uniqueness of those two different assemblages or communities um, from each other. So high values of beta diversity indicate uh, very different, unique assemblages, and low values of beta diversity indicate more homogeneous communities. So they're they're very they're very similar. Uh, and in our study, temporal beta diversity was a was a really good way of quantifying assemblage variation through time. Um, so how, how different is a site or a community, you know, from itself at different time slices throughout a study? Uh, and that's what, 
the the question that I was very interested in because naturally benthic macroinvertebrates display quite a bit of seasonally driven variation in assemblage structure. So uh, any changes to that uh, could highlight losses in biodiversity that you wouldn't necessarily detect just by taking spot measurements of diversity or uh, solely looking at alpha diversity. Thank you. That was an excellent uh, explanation. Um, so we keep talking about it, diversity, diversity, diversity in these streams. Um, but why is it important uh, that there is a uh, highly biodiverse uh, community of invertebrates in streams? Benthic macroinvertebrates um, occupy a, a, a pretty important place in the stream ecosystem, kind of taking the big picture view um, they're basically just little organic matter processing machines, uh, and they occupy one of the key links between basal resources in the stream uh, and higher trophic levels. So when some stressor is causing shifts in how these uh, uh, primarily insects uh, are structured, uh, the infects don't just stay compartmentalized to that little group of organisms. Uh, and it's pretty well established at this point that biodiversity and ecosystem functions are linked and that when biodiversity declines, that's going to impact other processes going on in the stream, such as nutrient uptake and cycling, uh, detrital processing, uh, energy transfers, you know, up the food web. Um, so biodiversity is, is important just, just on its by itself, uh, from, from that perspective. Uh, but as a scientist, they're, they're an absolutely fantastic uh, group of study organisms because within the macroinvertebrate group or the macroinvertebrate assemblage, there's a huge diversity even within that assemblage in the way that they feed and what types of materials they consume, what habitats they prefer, what time of the year that they're active, and how they interact with each other. So, so it really makes them ideal when you're asking questions about um, how anthropogenic stressors are you know, impacting biodiversity. It's a great group of organisms to look at. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, finally, uh, as we start talking about your paper, um, could you summarize your paper uh, in the form of a haiku? <laughs> uh, oh, oh, goodness. Uh, okay, so, hmm. Uh, inverts partition time, uh, add, add a little phosphorus, uh, the partitions go away. Good enough. That's excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, Good enough. Incredible. That was great. That was beautiful improvised haiku. I'm yeah, that's, that's that was pretty bad. Very impressed. <laughs> uh, okay, great. So you mentioned that uh, your work in this paper was a part of a larger project called the Scenic River Joint Phosphorus Study. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? So it's the history of the project um, and how it came to be. Absolutely. Uh, and this is, this is a really interesting part of the story. Um, and it's going to take a little bit of a history lesson and a little bit of a law lesson. Uh, and I'm, I'm definitely not a lawyer. So, so bear with me. Um, but the, the scenic rivers joint phosphorus study, uh, was put together by the scenic rivers joint study commission. Uh, and its objective was to determine at what level of phosphor phosphorus enrichment do any statistically significant shifts in algal species composition, or algal biomass occur um, that in turn result in undesirable uh, aesthetic conditions in the designated scenic rivers. And that's a mouthful. Uh, I, I, I totally understand um, that that's a mouthful, but the it's important uh, because Oklahoma has designated scenic rivers. Um, and to, to kind of understand that, uh, you need to understand a little bit about the, the structure of the watershed. So I mentioned that this was uh, a river uh, that spanned the border uh, uh, between Arkansas and Oklahoma. So the headwaters of this of this watershed uh, originate in Arkansas. They flow across the border into Oklahoma. Um, and once they do that, a lot of these waterways are Oklahoma designated scenic rivers, which affords them special protection uh, under state statute. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, another piece of this uh, puzzle that you need to understand is that there are two main uh, sources of phosphorus uh, in this watershed. Uh, 
Northwest Arkansas houses, I think second only to Georgia, the largest uh, density of poultry production uh, in the United States. Uh, and where you have lots of chickens, you have lots of chicken poop. Um, and it makes a really cheap uh, fertilizer for for people to spread on their fields and the pastures. Um, but it's also very high in phosphorus, uh, runs off, uh, gets into the waterways, uh, uh, and that's one source of, you know, phosphorus loading to these systems. Uh, the other source of phosphorus in the Illinois River watershed uh, is uh, Arkansas, northwest Arkansas is experiencing a pretty large population boom. You got three big cities up there. You've got uh, Springdale, Ro- Springdale, Rogers, Fayetteville, um, and where you have a lot of people, you need uh, wastewater treatment plants. That's just kind of how it goes. Um and it just so happens that historically, um, uh, a lot of the, or quite a few of the, uh, wastewater treatment plants are placed on, you know, waterways like they normally are. Uh, but sometimes they've been very close to the border between Arkansas and Oklahoma. Um, sometimes almost comically close to the border of Arkansas and Oklahoma. And that's not, you know, from any malice on, you know, Arkansas's part, that's just, you know, where the population centers are located. So that's two big sources or big potential sources of phosphorus in this watershed. Um, and uh, all the way back to the 1970s, um, they started noticing uh, algae blooms, uh, both in the Illinois River and in Lake Tinkiller, which is what the Illinois uh, uh, empties into. Uh, and Oklahoma didn't appreciate this. And uh, and this culminated in a Supreme Court decision. Um, there was lots of litigation back and forth between Oklahoma and Arkansas. And this culminated in a Supreme Court decision in 1992, um, where Oklahoma uh, disagreed with the issuance of a permit, an EPA permit for a wastewater treatment plant facility uh, that emptied into the, the Illinois River um, and, and sued and brought suit. Uh, and that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court decided that the permit would stand, like that was a valid permit. Uh, but the really important part of that Supreme Court decision is that it set the president uh, that the EPA had wide latitude to interpret water quality standards and could take into account downstream uh, water quality criteria in the issuances of their permits. So. And this was a big deal. Like it, it acknowledged the interconnectedness of waterways, um, and really acknowledged that. Uh, so, you know, if I have a, a stream going through my backyard, um, and it originates in your backyard, uh, Stephen, uh, what goes on or what you do in your backyard has it has a direct influence on me and the and the part of the water going through my backyard. So it was really an acknowledgement of that. It was really important for for case law in the United States because if if, if they hadn't found that. Uh, water quality criteria in the United States would always be set by the lowest common denominator, uh, and water always flows downhill. It's you know one of the one of the big fixtures of life. You know, death taxes and water flows downhill. Um, so it was a really important important decision. Um, uh, and since that time, uh, the two states have really been working together to reduce phosphorus loads, and this this culminated in. Uh, uh, it's called the Statement of Joint Principles. Um, it's basically both states getting together and going, you know, like we need to stop the litigation back and forth. Forth, let's let's both work together to reduce phosphorus loads to this watershed. Um, you know, like we both care about the quality of the water. You know, uh, uh, both states do. Uh, and they got together and uh, appointed a joint study committee. So this was three experts, uh, appointed by the governor of Oklahoma and three ex- experts appointed by, uh, the governor of Arkansas. And these, uh, these experts, uh, got together and, uh, appointed an out of state third party. And, uh, my advisor, Ryan King, um, put together a, a great study and was selected to, to conduct the study. And, you know, it was definitely to my benefit because I, you know, I learned a lot from this and, uh, was able to collect some amazing data. So that's, I, I realize that's a pretty long no, history lesson, but, but, uh, it really has been going on, you know, since the 1970s, uh, and, and has some really cool, you know, milestones along the way, uh, and has culminated in this, in this project. Yeah. Thank you. That was, that was an excellent history lesson. I think you did a really good job, uh, introducing it. 
Um, so you mentioned us uh, in, in sort of like the, the, the mission statement of this project was to determine at what point uh, elevated phosphorus concentrations resulted in undesirable um, aesthetic conditions brought in by algae blooms. So could you talk about uh, what's so undesirable about these algae blooms? Can you talk just about what it looked like when these blooms occurred? Yeah, absolutely. So the 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 primary tax of concern uh, in this uh, in these waterways is a is a nuisance green algae called uh, Cladophora. It's a it's a filamentous algae, uh, and it can really really explode and bloom and proliferate uh, at high levels of total phosphorus, uh, and it will absolutely carpet. Uh, the bottom of stream beds, and you'll get these huge long streamers of Cladophora, sometimes feet and feet long, um, uh, that completely transform, you know, even like the physical structure of the benthos uh, when clad really takes off. Um, and when it gets grazed down, like it gets, you know, like these very like thick mat, like these carpets of clad that, you know, look almost like shag carpet ish. Um, so, so the nuisance uh, uh, algae blooms can really, really um, result in some, you know, undesirable, you know, uh, I might even border on kind of gross uh, aesthetic qualities um, and certainly uh, affects uh, life that's living in the stream, um, you know, and the benthic macrovertebrates, which are <laughs> near and dear to my heart. Yeah, right. Uh, and also, so I get, at this point, I, I'm going to say full disclosure, I was a technician on this project and worked alongside uh, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Cook here. And I remember, um, in addition to, yeah, obviously having this big impact on that they convertebrates and it being really nasty looking to speak more on that, like we would regularly see folks like floating down the river near yeah, at some of our sampling locations, and like I could very much, you know, see how this these big blooms could negatively impact recreational ecosystem services that the that the streams provide. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like this is like I can't I can't impress you know upon your listeners enough how how Gorgeous. beautiful of a watershed this is and how special the air, this area of the country is. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, you know, and like you know, Oklahoma. Uh, designated these uh, state scenic rivers for a reason. You know they are a um, a resource that is worthy of protection and preservation. Um, so you know anything that negatively influences uh, you know both wildlife co- wildlife conservation or outdoor recreational value, you know, is is a concern. Um, so it, it it's I was really you know glad that I could be a part of this project. You know. Because I think, you know, two different uh, entities or two different states, you know, getting together and saying, you know, this is something that we want to address and we're going to do it in a in a scientifically defensible manner. And we're going to listen to the recommendations that, you know, the team puts forth, you know, uh, I think that's I think it's a really, you know, a special thing that uh, hasn't really happened a lot, or at least to my knowledge, hasn't really happened a lot. Uh, yeah, in the I past. Agree. That, that is something that was really special about this project. Um, can you talk a little bit more uh, about that um, in terms of, uh, of how it felt for you to be a graduate student working on a project that you knew would have uh, you know, potential policy implications for, for the state? Uh, sure. Yeah, it was um, uh kind of a sobering experience, uh, to be completely honest with you, you know, uh, I, you know, I've been involved in the research in the past that, you know, has, has, you know, effect on me. Um, but, you know, contributing to a project that is directly going to, you know, influence, you know, uh, public policy and, you know, nutrient criteria, uh, I was very conscious of that. Uh, and my, my advisor, Ryan King, you know, did a very good job of, you know, well, one designing and implementing the study, but, but two, you know, involving his graduate students, you know, in this project, uh, but also insulating us enough from, you know, the greater study, you know, enough that we could, you know, like concentrate on doing good science, uh, without necessarily having to worry about, you know, like stakeholder meetings and like standing up in front of those, you know, people and, uh, uh, so I think I think Ryan, did, you know, you know, balanced those two needs very, very well. Like, hey, this is part of a larger project, but you know, 
you also have the latitude to 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 go out do good science ask interesting questions so i was i was really lucky in that regard yeah so you mentioned uh stakeholder meetings um were there any other sort of outreach or communication efforts that the research team as a whole or maybe ryan more specifically uh took part in uh as a part of this project uh sure um you, you might have to have ryan back on to to get a really good detailed answer to that question uh but <laughs> yeah, but just just for uh, for my side of things, um, just talking to members of the community and, and, you know, kind of being kind of injected into that situation, you know, at the beginning, you know, having some knowledge of it, but not really like having a, a gut understanding of how long these issues have been being, have, have, have been discussed, you know, in that watershed, you know, everybody knows about these issues if you, if you live in that watershed. So talking to, to people who live there, uh, and, uh, landowners, you know, like, you know, streams, you know, go through land and, uh, occasionally we would encounter landowners who were, you know, had a you know, varying degree of, uh, of curiosity about the project. Uh, but talking to them and, and seeing just how important, uh, uh, water quality was and, uh, how important the, the, the streams and the rivers in this region were to them, like was a very, was a very good experience, was a very neat experience and communicating, you know, what we were doing, why we were, we were collecting this data, uh, how the benthic macroinvertebrate uh, uh, community could, you know, tell us things uh, about the stream ecosystem as a whole. Like that was, that was a very good, you know, learning experience for me. Yeah. So this, this seems like this was a very um, impactful and like large scale project. Um, did you encounter uh, any like challenges along the way in field work or any other any notable events that uh that that were a challenge that you had to overcome uh sure uh i i would say the one you know like the the paper that that we were discussing earlier you know uh was concerned with the benthic macroinvertebrate assemblage uh, and the, I, I would say the first challenge is, is not really understanding how large of an undertaking that was going to be when I, when I, uh, when I first started. Um, so, you know, we had 35 sites, you know, in this watershed and we sampled every other month for two years. Uh, and those HES samples add up really quick. Um, and I, I can't remember, um, like you had mentioned that you were, you were a technician on the project and really, you know, integral to, to processing, you know, these samples. Uh, I don't know at what sampling event we got a little bit behind. Um, but the first challenge was just getting through and counting and identifying these samples, uh, in a timely manner. And I can't emphasize enough how, how much of a team effort that that was, um, you know, if, you know, I wasn't the only graduate student working on the project. Uh, Lauren Housley also worked on the invert samples. Uh, uh, you, uh, Catherine Hooker, and Morgan Betcher were awesome technicians. Uh, and if 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 we didn't have uh, you guys, I would literally at this moment still be sitting in front of a microscope, uh, picking and identifying benthic macroinvertebrates. So, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and that was kind of the Good first uh, the first hurdle uh, that we had to reach. Um, and I can't think of any other like huge, you know, giant uh, uh, hurdles that we had to we had to cross. And that's to you know, all credit to 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 Ryan for really designing uh, and doing you know some amazing site selection uh, to to answer the questions that we were interested in. Um, you know, everything kind of goes you know smooth. You know, everything is more smooth the more work that you do before the study actually starts. So, you know, credit to Ryan for that. We did have a, a large, uh, 500 year flood, uh, towards the end of the study, um, which really just completely moved some of the streams like, you know, in their path. Um, and you know, uh, this was, you know, kind of a unique experience for my career because it's the first time that I've, I've gotten to go back and go to the same sites, you know, again and again and again, and see, you know, just how variable stream ecosystems are. So the the 500 year flood was was a, you know, a hurdle, but also a really good opportunity to see how these communities respond to, uh, you know, semi catastrophic scouring event, you know, and how you know the successional patterns afterwards. Yeah, great. It really was cool um, revisiting those same sites again and again throughout the years. And seeing how during some sampling events the 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 stream would be down to just a, a trickle, barely any water at all, and then 
two months later, it'd be huge. It'd be like 30 or 40 meters across and roaring. So I, I think that was, uh, that was a really cool part of the project is to see how, um, how much in flux the uh, stream ecosystems really are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and a lot of these, you know, since, uh, since, you know, this, the, the paper we were talking, uh, my paper, you know, deals with, you know, the temporal component, you know, any temporal change that, that we saw was, a was a really interesting part of the story of that ecosystem for me. Uh, and these are, these are, you know, most of these streams, uh, have are perennial, they have, you know, uh, base flow year round. Um, but you're right, like, you know, the, the changes in hydrology, you know, season to season um, and the changes in the community, I think, are, are a really, you know, interesting and understudied part uh, of, of what's happening in these streams ecosystems. Uh, okay, great. That's all that I have for you right now. Is there any, um, anything else that you'd like to say about stream eutrophication and how it impacts macroinvertebrate diversity or, or anything else about the project that you'd like to you like you want people to know about no i think those were excellent questions and i i really uh, appreciated the opportunity to talk to you about it yeah anytime thanks for joining us thank you steven you've been listening to the making waves podcast brought to you with support by the society for freshwater science for more information on this speaker the making waves podcast or the society in general, please visit us on the web at the Society for Freshwater Science webpage. Tune in next time for another fresh idea in freshwater science.